If you go to Mexico City today, you will see that some places is like filthy. Buildings, churches. So, Teosinti, that's the, the premises of corn. This is a white grass. And as a white grass, what they did, the Mayans, they domesticated the plant. So they saw some potential on the plant, and they play with it. So that's how, over time, there are even more varieties of, of uh, corn. So the name Teochintli comes from the Teo, means God. So notice from the beginning, in the Nahuatl language, which is the language of the Aztecs, they were already giving attributes to divinity associated with this crop. God's ear of corn. In 1497, when cost, in 1492, later 1497, Christopher Columbus take this plant to Europe as one of those exotic crops. <laughs> By the way, corn is not a vegetable. Okay? It's not considered a vegetable. And then Cortez in 1519, when he arrived 500 years ago this year, he also gets enticed by the engagement that the local pueblos had with the plant. But keep in mind, the Aztec were a nomadic tribe, just like most of the tribes that, you know, were hunters. With the arrival of corn, things begin to change. So these are part of a representation from the 1600s by Fra Franciscan priests that came to the New World to Christianize the Indians. So they start, you know, describing what they were seeing. In Mexico too, as you go to visit the Anthropological Museum, you start seeing how the Aztecs were heavy on trade in the marketplace. Big, cacao was a currency, but then they will, they were mainly a vegetarian society and they will eat some type of meat, maybe fish, snakes, uh, some insects, but they were mainly a vegetarian society. In a very orderly manner. So you were, markets like this, they were having 25,000 people. And in Mexico, you still have this type of resemblance where people go to the open streets are open on weekends and they become what they call tianguis. So these varieties over time became more and more diverse up to now about 300 different kinds. Now, how did they cultivate it? That's what is fascinating. They have a system called chinampas. And a chinampa was something that they built at the lake using wood and dirt and then they will plant the seed and have canals where they will navigate and crop the plant. The plant takes about 60 to 90 days to be ready for harvesting. So think about it. They have to be extremely creative. The, the, uh, the maize was the most cultivated plant, so that was the plant central to the diet of the Mesopotamian cultures. <coughs> in this particular piece, you see how Diego Rivera illustrates in this composition where you have the indigenous planting, and then you have also the different manifestations here, you know, doing, making tortillas, preparing the masa, making the various called atole, the multiple use of the corn. Time Magazine. And how corn now has become a very modified crop. You know? So corn is no longer cultivated for human consumption. It's mainly though for energy. So if you reflect the origins to now, it has changed the nature of corn. Uh, is genetically modified. 
The U.S. is the top producer. The U.S. sells to Mexico corn now. Iowa produces more corn than Mexico. So you see how thing has changed. The Corn Belt states here Iowa, Iowa produces almost 50% of all the corn produced in the U.S. So it's a very different scenario as we, so these are the mainly uses, like I say, automobile, um, human consumption as a feedstock. I want to tell you about the use of ethanol and how soybeans is an issue right now as it relates to China trade, okay? We know that the Chinese have decided we're not gonna buy so much, so much soybeans because of taxations. So uh, the current system in Washington say, okay, we're gonna increase the use of corn on ethanol from 10% to 15% on energy production. So people that was traditionally cultivating soybean will move into corn where there is already a secure market. And that way, you farmers that are having problems selling soybeans, you're gonna sell your corn now as an energy consumption. So it's interesting how that today has changed. If you can see the United States force close to 40% of all the corn worldwide. So we have a production machine that is very sophisticated. The main destination of that corn is Mexico. Mexico. So it's interesting how the ancients will look at this today. You know. uh, and here are the, the different production state, being Iowa the top producer. Um, So as I was doing this research, I started thinking, does, does corn make a sound? Because remember, the plant is ready between 60 and 90 days, depending on the sun and the rain levels. So and I, I, I was able to find a video that accelerated the process so we can hear how the plant actually, something that the ancients knew, so that living But we cannot capture the sound, but um, I have a movie here, but it's not. sound of corn. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's uh, continue. Um, and now let's get into the uh,
So now we're gonna get into the end. We're gonna get now into go back now to the myth. We talk about what happened, how it came about. It was a, 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 a white grass what gave birth to the domestication of, of what became corn. But if we go back to the early classical period, the Mayans, the Mayans believed that we actually were made out of corn. And the way that they explain it in their book called uh, the Popol Vuh, the tale of creation, written in the Quiche language, they, be, they the, the Supreme God tried first mud and create four men made of mud. But then he realized that the mud, when it got dry or it rained, it will disintegrate. Then he decided later, let's try wood. But they noticed that wood did not smile and did not have a soul. So decide to turn them into monkeys. That's the Maya. And then the third option was corn. And he realized that corn made them smile, made them have a soul, and made them flexible. Made them flexible. But then they were also concerned because the main reason why they were doing this was so they could be worshipped. Mm -hmm. And the wood and the, and the clay would not worship them. But the, 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 the maiz could accomplish the worship them of their creator. Um, but then they were also concerned about can they become like us? So the Mayan decide to shadow their, 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 their vision. So that they will see through clouds, not clearly. <laughs> Which is interesting how that concept of uh, uh, the creation and the interaction with the divine is always something that has is very constant in, in traditions. You know, how do we prevent the Greeks had some of that? So that made the men of wood and then the men of maize capable of offering praise and keeping track of time. That's something that was very important for the Mayans too. So here, we have the mummy. Here you have the corn being processed and then the male god making the first human being. He made four. He used white corn and yellow corn for this. And out of this came all the races. Here you have a representation of the feast. How the, the, the corn to start was mainly a female occupation. Males will do the planting, but females will run it after. All the process, all the feeding, that brings the element of mother nature and nurturing. And that's why in this era, in this particular, you have a woman processing what will become the first human male. So out of this, um, you have a serpent, traditional, but notice the serpent in this inside have corn in the cup. Because the serpent is also associated with fertility in creation, with the god Quetzalcoatl. Out of that came humanity. So here the artist is representing this process and a scriba that is recording this creation. So as I was doing this art history project, these were the scenes that really got my attention. Why is corn such a central piece of this muralistic work associated with the creation from the Popol Vuh? Here you have, again, the creation. You have the men 
And out of the right arm, you have the plan being raised. So again, you see this representation where even the, the underground life is reflected on the exterior life. And we're gonna see more of this in a few minutes, in a few seconds. So we're gonna go to the Museum of Anthropology, and this is the sculpture of Tlaloc. Tlaloc is the god of rain. And rain is needed if you're gonna do agriculture. So Tlaloc, for the Aztecs, he was the cause of corn. He created corn. For, for the Mayans, they have a different version, okay? So Tlaloc, in this particular, in Teotihuacan, that's where you have the pyramids, there are these frescoes, and notice here in the back, he has a corn basket. And in the front, a corn plant. So we are talking about before the Aztecs here, Teo, 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 Teotihuacan, Teotihuacan, sorry. So, and then here you have the, the female priestess casting maize seeds. Florentine Codex, this were the manuscript that the, the friars did to describe the life that the indigenous people were living. And this is one that is called Florentine because it's the city of Florence. And then they, they describe some of these traditions that were made in oral traditions. And what they did, they registered it. Here is Tlaloc helping my plant to grow. So here is the god of rain participating in that ritual. Eating Men and maestas are few, so another codex, this is called Vienna because that's where he ended. That's what the friars uh, uh, registered all their, 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 their visual uh, and interaction with the Indians. So here is interesting because now we have a process where a woman is grinding maize, okay? This is in 1924, but notice this piece is called Metate, and it still is used in Mexico to grind. This will be like a modern blender, which you see it in these particular pieces before, too. You see it right there. So all this information, again, they also is used to grind cacao to make chocolate. So it was a high technology for food preparation at that time. So we have Tlaloc, the god of rain, participating in this creation. So we move forward and we notice that, uh, again, woman is, this, is the main uh, uh, generator of, 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 uh, of the nutrition. This is Mexico City at the Government Palace. This is Diego Rivera, 1929, 1935. These are frescoes that also put at the center the cultivation of maize. In the back, you can see the chinapas, the islands where the crow will be. And then, I'm gonna do a close up here, you have the process unfolding. Uh, here you have the Maiz Festival, something that they do in Mexico as well in the fall, because corn is cultivated in the spring and then you harvest it in the fall, especially August, September. Obviously August here is still hot, but in Mexico it's not that warm. This is a, a chapel called the Chapingo Chapel. So this is in the outskirts of Mexico City. Here, what Diego Rivera, he was commissioned to do a mural to depict the creation of Mexico. And you see, and this is school is the School of Agriculture in Mexico. So in the School of Agriculture, you have 
this particular fresco, where you have here Emiliano Zapata, the revolutionary, creating the, fertil the fertility of ideas of the revolution. And his death gives cropping. So, you know, think about the theme of Abraham Lincoln. You know, he was the fertilization of a new America, right? Mm -hmm. That abolished slavery or was a key element in the reconstruction. So if we will use it out of, out of having Abraham Lincoln, he will have here the new society. With some mistakes, obviously, but he was. <laughs> so what Diego Rivera did, he used two revolutionary figures and that blood fertilized the soil. So it was not done in vain. Going to the Southwest USA, New Mexico, the state of New Mexico. In New Mexico, they have these doll calcachinas. You know, those that often uh, are used from cotton wood trees, very light. But this particular cachina is holding the plant. They use the, the, the Pueblo Indias, they call it the corn mother. So here we have another romantic de description of this amazing crop. You know. They call it the corn mother. That corn mother, in the early life, the Pueblos were hunters. So they live out of hunting. Then they realized that they were running out of animals to hunt. Then they approached the corn mother and said, Mom, we don't have food anymore. We got problems. The corn mother decide, I'm gonna sacrifice myself. I'm gonna become your nourishment. Obviously the husband opposed him, opposed her. She has kids. Ultimately, they consulted with the gods and the god allowed the corn mother body to be sacrificed. So what they did, how do you cut this part of the corn? Oh. You know, sometimes it's kind of dark. Here. So they hold the mother and graft her around the fields from her hair. From her hair. And every place that she was journey became cornfields, cornfields. Uh, so again, a very different approach, but it still is central to the role of the female, an element of nourishment, uh, fertility, provider. So this particular piece, this artist, uh, created this piece called the corn mother. Notice the corn mother. This is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at the Indian market. But you can see here that at the base, it has this adobe type of houses. Okay, adobe. Why is that important? Because the corn mothers inside of the house, that's where all the maize will be processed, will be ritualized, and if, if uh, you have a daughter, the daughter will visit with the grandmother and will teach her how to process so she will be able to feed her family. So that was at the center of uh, being ready for marriage. Are you able to do the mother corn uh, rituals? Here we have more cachinas. These are uh, sacred clowns associated with fertility, rain, corn, and corn pollen. Very different than the Bayans and the Aztecs and the other tribes, however, is still a centerpiece of the way they understood nature. Because they were agricultural society, so they depend on agriculture to explain everything that was around them as they look at the stars and astronomy. 
So this is a book called When Jesus Came, The Commodores Went Away. This is a book was written by a New Mexican. And it's interesting because the book pretty much says, you know, when, and it's something that I, I validate after, when Cortez arrived in Mexico and he saw maize being consumed, he thought that was something inferior because Europeans were eating wheat. So for them to see corn, that's not some, so what the Spanish did, they changed the agriculture to seeds that they brought from Europe. Primo denying the locals those foods that they like, um, corn and, uh, and cacao and other plants that they were accustomed. So the, uh, the, the Cherokee Green Dance. So during the fall, prior to the eating of the, of the crop, there has to be a dance. Thanking the gods for providing, you know, for that, for that year uh, uh, food and sustain, sustain, sustainability. And this is the Sunni Pueblo. So, so the, the, the mother, the father's mother, and the daughter, they spend time together to have continue, to give continuity to that tradition and the welfare of people. So the Sunni Pueblos, the Cherokees, the Navajo, all of them see maize as a centerpiece to their cropping. So here you have the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is an evolution of that concept associated with provider. More, this is in Los Angeles. I want to tell you about Huitlacoche. You probably have seen this before. Huitlacoche is a fungus, a fungus. And this fungus is highly nutritious. Um, you make enchiladas, you use it in tacos, you know, you blend it with cheese. And um, it surprised me that it has not arrived in the US yet. <laughs> Maybe because of the visual. Yeah. But in Mexico, it's a delicacy. It's a delicacy. So if you have a chance one day, check it out. The French are already making with a cup with La Coche creams. And I think it tastes like corn. That's what it tastes like. It doesn't taste like dirt. Some, it tastes just like corn because it's part of that uh, the composition that takes place is a fungus, but it's highly nutritious. So the wheat lacoche. And again, it's the visuals does not match what happens in your palate. <laughs> I was going to bring some, but I run out of uh, So corn, think about it. When you go to a Mexican market, this is corn. Think about what you are faced with. Think about your face with. This is how the ancients, you know, they did the, uh, so today we were having uh, tortillas and tamales with tacos. So the question is who was first, the tortilla or the tamal? <laughs> Any guess? The tamal came first. The tamal came first. And what is interesting, the tamal was also a meal to take with you, to take with you. And the variety, there are over 400 types of tamales. I mean, with, with honey, with, uh, with bugs, with corn, I mean, anything. It depends on the region of Mexico. <laughs> depends on the region of Mexico. Like, you go to Oaxaca, there is a tamal cala. I'm gonna go back to them. So the tacos, the street tacos, in Mexico, tacos is a street food, a street food. In the US, they call it a street tacos, but they are not a street food. You gotta go to a restaurant. The second part about street tacos, they came to the US in the early 1900s. 
when the Mexican immigrants came to work on the railroad and mines, and they brought them, so that's when they arrived in California. But obviously at that time was something associated with poverty in Mexico. Now with street tacos can cost you, you know, 20 bucks for three, you know, because the beautiful plate and all the, the music, all the stuff that goes with it. Uh, so here, notice that tacos, the street taco has two tortillas. And it's because you can, it's the first one melts, the second one we cash it there. <laughs> so we go fall in your hand. In street tacos, you eat them with your hands, standing up. You don't sit. That's the traditional way in Mexico. You go to a taqueria, you stand, and they give it to you in a piece of paper. Sometimes they put a, you know, might, they might give you a plate if you don't, but that is a street meal. So some variety of tamales. And this particular uh, fresco, this is in uh, Yucatan Peninsula, close to the, to, uh, to where uh, the, uh, uh, the Petén. So you see here the depiction of a couple eating tamales. So again, you know, we are talking about something that was central to the way their life was enjoyed, lived, shared. This tamal here is called tamal de Dia de los Muertos. So this tamal is a dark tamal, and it has smashed beans, and they associated this with Day of the Dead tradition. Think about what the Mayan and the Aztecs will think when they will say, oh, wow. This is something that we started because we want to be, we need something to feed ourselves, to keep our civilization going. And now we have this evolution with the US is the top producer. Most of the corn that is produced worldwide is not for consumption. It is for other uses. The Aztecs and the Mayas never cultivated corn, corn unless it was for their tummy to be fed. <laughs> and they, you know, they make, as I told you, a beverage as well. So that's pretty much what I have in this case. And I will be glad to, uh, if you have some questions, to take them. And I want to offer this to Christina for <laughs> taking the chance for this story. Thank you. Go get your corn. Get you, this is your trophy. Oh. <laughs> this is organic, and you can cook it tonight. Have oh, more oh actually, eat it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Corn isn't a vegetable. What is it? It's like it's like a grind, like a wheat, like rice. Same same family. So it's a grain. Like so grain, like yes. It's a grain. Corn is a grain. It's not a vegetable. And think about how grain in society has been the bread, right? The, the stuff that goes with the rest of the meal. So for the, for the Aztecs and the Mayas, the tortilla, the crepes, the reason for the name tortilla has nothing to do first with them. It has to do with the Spanish. Because when they saw the meat, they call it torta. The Spanish eat the tortas, you know, circle crepes. Mm -hmm. And then later it became a tortilla. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Aztecs also, they were a civilization that were extremely conscious about cleanness. 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 Which make all these uh, chinapas, how they cultivated. And you will say, how did they add nutrients to the soil? One of the things that they asked they had, that they were a zero waste society. Their, their, their urines, their pee pee, was used in the production of corn. Mm. Their urines, they would collect it. Oh. So it's interesting how the way they 
eh, came together to fed a civilization was so creative. Sadly, when you study the conquest, all what we hear is the bloody <coughs> uh, rituals, all that stuff. Ignoring that there are some things that were to be, ad to be admired. Because imagine how life will be today without corn. You know, we eat so much of that. <laughs> but we forget how all it started. You know? And I do believe in this specific topic, as we are educators, educators, how this topic applies to teaching to culture. Because our students, more and more are Hispanic students. And I guarantee you, their mothers know what is a fresh tortilla, <laughs> which is an honor when you create fresh tortillas. So I have a class that I did a small present, a smaller presentation than this, and then they were told their, they went home and told their mothers it was a dual credit card, du dual credit class, and they say, Mr. Well, I told my mother about the origin of corn, and they engaged in a conversation. Because those, those traditions for families is still very relevant. In spite that now they can go to Taco Bell. <laughs> the other thing I want to tell you about Taco Bell, they don't succeed in Mexico. Because Mexicans eat tacos in a different way than Americans do. And they don't, they don't like the crispy tortilla. They want the skin. The tortilla is like a human skin. It's soft. You manipulate it. So, so next time you eat tacos, stand up and use your hands <laughs> <laughs> and a piece of paper. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Yes. Uh, how did the evolution of the flour tortilla come into play? Good question. The flour tortilla is a border issue. Oh, yes. Oh, Along the border, you know, El Paso Juarez is another Mexico issue. Yes. <laughs> you know burrito. You know the burrito. Mm -hmm. The burrito is a flour tortilla. Mm -hmm. I mean, you put it on a corn, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. The burrito was created in El Paso Juarez. El Paso Juarez. Because it could have never been created in Mexico using a flour tortilla, which they don't consume. Flour is no. A, a, a traditional meal in Mexico. It came with the Europeans, but was not something that they were engaged. So Mexico is still very traditionalist when it comes to corn. What they do now, they make it more sophisticated. But the corn is still the base. Burrito, it has to do with the, the feeling inside. You know a burrito, right? The donkey. So they carry weight. Yeah. So the burrito is due to the cargamen that has inside. Hmm. That's how burrito came about, because of the cargamen that is carrying, hmm. like the burro does. Are you? Good. Try one more. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. You know, I grew up in El Salvador. I never ate corn coming from the refrigerator before I arrived in the US. <laughs> Every time I would eat corn, I saw at home breaking everything. Until I came to America and I saw the plastic bags with the corn inside. <laughs> because obviously, that's, that meal for people in Central America is at the center. A tortilla is at the center of our daily meals. You eat it with cheese. Poor people eat it with salt. Like if you are in poverty, you eat tortillas with salt. Tortilla with salt. That's it. Yes? Uh, is there anywhere local we can get that fungus corn that you were talking about? You know Goya? You know Goya, the, the, the food Goya? Yeah. They make it, but sometimes I find it a fiesta, maybe. Uh, the, the, the reason with, with, uh, uh, with La Coche is that 
to engage with food, we are very visual in America. Instead of thinking, you know. So you might be drinking something that is nice, but it has 60 grams of sugar. You know. <laughs> but it looks good through your eyes. The can is nice and everything, but it's going to harm you. With Lacoche, on the other hand, it's the opposite. Visual is not very attractive, but I guarantee you, you eat it, you fall in love. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you. I didn't grow up eating with Lacoche, but now I'm a follower. Every time I can find it, I ask for it. It's a, the French are using it a lot because you know the French are very into exploration of culinary things and uh, they make amazing creams. And they add corn, real corn, mm -hmm. like the solid is real corn, but the cream is the wheat lacoche. Mm -hmm. Any more? Can yes. you uh, just I don't know if you know what all food is over there, but the types of dishes that we have here, can you just explain it? So, for those uh, who so we go back, we talk about uh, tacos and tamales. In Mexico, uh, there is a say and say, we are a city or a country of the tea diet. T, T diet. D I E T. A tea diet in Mexico means tamales, tortillas, and tacos. That's the tea diet. <laughs> but you can see, when you understand the origins, you understand. Let me show you this book. This is Frida Kahlo Recipes. Once you understand the centrality of corn, you can read the cover better. Just like again, if you understand when all this representation, artistic representation, why is corn there? It's because it has to do with the umbilical cord of that society. Mm -hmm. And they explain it through mythology, you know, through commercial terms, through culinary. You know, the Spanish saw it in a different way, but the fact is, it's still here today. And it's changing, obviously, because of energy, mainly because of uh, Ethanol, but uh, it keeps going. Yes. Is street corn a traditional food? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, in Mexico, corn beat hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you are walking in Mexico <laughs> and you put mayonnaise. <laughs> You put mayonnaise, you put cheese, you add chili. Chili is another Mesoamerican that didn't exist in Europe. And then you make a mess with yourself. <laughs> but you enjoy that mess. Yeah. And you do it standing up, <clears throat> walking. So they do it on the ear, not in a cup? Oh, that's another option. But this is the one that connects you to the but you know, to do this, it's just, you, you know, kids, you know, it's just, it's just a, a, something to notice the joy. It takes time to eat because you have to keep cleaning yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But th so that, that way, and then again, the tacos, like I said, street food. Um, mm. It's also associated with socioeconomics. You know, no matter how poor you are, you should be able to buy corn and maize, tortillas, and eat. <laughs> Europeans made it look like that was the meal of the peasants. Okay? Wealthy, wealthy Mexicans, <coughs> they rather wheat. Because that connects them to the European legacy. But more and more, corn is becoming that, that dish that makes Mexicans proud. Because they are discovering how much influence had in what they have become. So, what was the uh, the first version of corn before they started using that? It started with a T. What was it called? Uh, it was a, a, a white grass. Do they still do they still consume that in Mexico? It's still, no, no, they don't consume it anymore. It still exists, but it's not consumed uh, anymore. Let me give you the the. Uh, there is no consumption of that because actually this cannot be consumed. 
because they have the attributes to be called a crop, something for food, goals. They will sin. Does it have the consistency? Oh. So what you have here, notice the size. This is a, a 25 cents coin. Look, it's very small. Yeah. But it serves as the point of departure for what we now enjoy. So the coin reflects the, the size ratio. So every time you eat corn, from now on, remember the past. I, I tell my students, everything tastes better with knowledge. Because you tend to appreciate more what you are doing. That. And probably corn is going to grow more and more as the demographics changes more and more. I wouldn't be surprised that one day I will go to uh, a restaurant that we have corn and I will put my mayonnaise and and then we have with La Coche. You take someone with an amazing drive of ideas and investors to realize this is something that, that makes sense because it's healthy, it's healthy. And we're gonna make it part of our, our, our uh, American culture that adopts everything. Okay, guys, thank you for being kind to me. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, then give me some tamales. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> That'll be on my to-do list. Maybe, so. but you know, you know that corn also <laughs> makes plastics. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Im imagine the development of corn now is used in packaging. It's bi biodegradable. Mm -hmm. It's okay. compostable plastic. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Okay. Wow, that's cool. So. All right, well, All thank, right, thank you, you everybody for joining us. And those of you who joined us uh, during the webinar, we appreciate you. Thank you. Hello thank from Fort Worth. Yes. Connect. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.